Let's continue. Now we're going to do bootstrapping. Um, saying anything to me? No? Um, bootstrapping. This is a bootstrap. The thing on your boots that you can, uh, this, this, this strap that sort of goes up. What can you do, a bootstrap? What can you use that for? Well, you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps, right? Just like, just like this guy did. Do we have a picture of him? Let's see. Now the picture is gone. Do you know uh, the Baron von Munchausen? And the tales about this guy, he pulled himself off, I believe, by the hair, I think. He get, got into the swamp by his horse, and he pulled himself up there. And uh, that's bootstrapping. Already there is a bit. <laughs> is that really what, what we're going to do? But there is a flavor of it. We're going to pull ourselves up a little bit by ourselves bootstrap in what we're going to do now. Um, we're going to solve the problem now. What should we do when we have small sample sizes and we cannot allow the assumption, or we don't want to use the assumption of normality? So we need to do something else. Um, there could be different paths along here. There could be different things we could do in the big perspective, actually. If it's not a normal distribution which is in play, we could potentially find or think if we could realize which other distribution should we use. It could be a log normal, it could be an exponential, it could be a third or fourth or a fifth thing. That's a valid approach. Still, um, there is a maybe a more general approach and a more safe approach and maybe also a more naive or a more simple-minded approach. What if we could avoid making any assumptions whatsoever about the system? That could be neat. If we're not really sure what the real, how the real system actually behaves, then I'd, I'd not like to assume the normal. I'd not, not like to assume a log normal. I'd not like to assume an exponential. I'd like to not assume anything, not to make sure I don't do mistakes. Whenever you assume something, you might make a mistake. Maybe it's not true. Um, so we have a bootstrapping, which is a name for different things, actually. There is actually something which is named parametric bootstrap, which is a little more following this idea of simulating from some distributions and just using it as a tool to compute complicated features of our system. That's not so much, that's not actually the version I'm going to share with you, apart from having shared with you the idea of simulation in general, which makes good sense, as, as I've just showed you last lecture. No, what I'm going to focus on here is what is known as the non-parametric bootstrap. That is to artificially create new samples. That is the idea of the bootstrap, that we sample from the data we have. Let's, let's dwell on this a little, uh, just a moment. What is the problem? What is the problem if the data is not described by a normal distribution and we want to do statistics and we might think about using the tools of chapter 7 and 8? What is the problem there? The problem is that the sampling distribution of the mean is not a normal and it's not a T, right? If the theory in chapter six and seven is using either the normal or the T distribution to come up with probability statements for confidence interval and for hypothesis testing, and this comes from a theoretical uh, derivation of the result, that we can find out that the sampling distribution of the average or of the mean follows a normal or a t. But now if we cannot use that result, we cannot use this distribution assumption for the sampling distribution. Because the situation is that if we do many samples, it will not, the way the mean behaves will not be like a normal. Hey, what's the big problem? Let me see how it, how it goes. That's the idea of bootstrap. 
Let me, if I have 20 data points or 10 or 15 data points, let me many times create new samples. I'm worried about the sampling distribution. How does my average behave from sample to sample? Well, I, and I don't believe the theory people telling me that if you assume this and this and that, you can use this theory. Forget about it. I don't want to use it. I want to do it on my own. I want to be a naive programmer. What do I do? I just do many samples myself. I'm repeating myself here, right? <laughs> I, I shuffle the data that I have, or at least I sample actually with replacement. So I cre make, create many new versions of a sample of 10, and then I look at what happens. That's the idea, that's the simulation idea. The bootstrapping, and in a way you pull yourself up by sort of looking at your own data again and again in different ways. And uh, that will give you some information about the noise, the variability, and the sampling distribution without assuming normality. Here is method number one. Here is method number one. This is an alternative alternative to what we learn in chapter 7 that we can take and find a confidence interval like this, right? Take the average plus minus some t or maybe set percentile and then take s over root n. That's the confidence interval that we could use if, if the assumptions are okay, right? Now I give you an alternative to this formula. I, I cannot give you a short formula to say what you should compute. I have to tell you how to do it in R, basically. Or I could, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm having a, a way of telling you how to do it which does not rely on R, which can be used for any type of software you would want to go and use. Because I'm just putting out in words what you should do. I'm saying, start by doing this resampling, the bootstrapping, as we call it. That is, many times, Take new samples from the samples you have, and you do it many times, typically a thousand or more. For each of those, let's say a thousand, for each of those thousand, that's, uh, this is number one, maybe I should put these numbers on, this is number two. Calculate the average in each of those k samples. So I many times take a new sample and I compute the average each time. The average is what I'm interested in now, in now, right? So I just many times compute the average and see what happens. And here is, I see what happens. Three is seeing what happens. You see, here's three. Look at what happens and define the confidence interval as sort of the, the percentage points, the percentiles of these observed distribution of the means. So basically, I could, uh, I get a histogram like this, blah, 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 blah. And I see, where is the point in the histogram where I have 2.5% in each, if it's uh, 95%? This is my confidence interval. Can I find such percentiles? Yes, I was taught back in the first lecture how you could find generally a percentile or a quantile. Or you could just have R do it for us. Let's try to do this uh, is in an example. Here's a little example that I brought that should uh, maybe bring some data that at least would, you would be a bit worried to assume, make a normal assumption here. Um, women's cigarette consumption before and after giving birth. I'm sure this is an old study. Um, here is a woman who smoked eight before she gave birth, let's say it's eight cigarettes a day. I believe that's uh, probably the, the numbers. And after, she smoked only five. Big improvement. And uh, here's another woman who smoked 24 during pregnancy and all. That's what they did back then. I mean, my parents, our parents, when we were born back in the 60s, they smoked. Maybe that's why we are like we are. And, uh, and so, so there is an explanation, right? <laughs> but that's it, that's it. People didn't worry too much about that. And uh, hey, couldn't matter that much. And, and breastfeeding, whoa, don't do it. Don't breastfeed. It's dangerous, all the heavy metals and all. So a lot of smoking, a lot of drinking, no breastfeeding. 
I shouldn't have given my mom this link, actually. Uh, anyway, she probably doesn't log in. Um, let's, what, what would we do here? What would we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We have eleven. Did I count correctly? Yeah. Eleven women here. Now, if, if we were back in the chapter six, seven, eight, nature, we are in a paired situation, right? So I would go for, if we say this was X and this was Y, we could do different things. Why don't we take the after and subtract the before to have sort of uh, what is the change from before to after. Um, and then we have a one sample situation, right? So I'm back to a one sample situation of such um, before after data. Let me see, do I have no? Yeah, I, I brought it here actually. Uh, let's do it in R in a sec, but let's just look at it here. Maybe it looks a bit nicer. Um, I put in the data for the 11 women, I compute the difference, right? I like much better actually to do it while I'm saying it. Here, I put in, I compute the difference. Let's just have a look at the data. Now it's a one sample data that looks like this, right? Um, the point is, these are counting cigarettes and also looking a bit odd, so I don't want to assume any normal assumption here. I would uh, be a bit worried about assuming, I mean, it's counting, so definitely it's not normal. The normal could potentially approximate things, but at least it's definitely not a normal distribution in play here. Um, now, here's the story. We could actually, let me dig out the thing here. There is actually some tools in R that makes the bootstrapping very easy for us. There is a tool, there is a function called sample. What does sample do? Let's see about that. Sample when I use replacement, that is I sample with replacement, makes different samples from the sample. Right? Here's the bootstrapping thing. We sample from the sample. We have our own sample and we resample it. That's why these methods are also called resampling methods. We sample the sample and we can do it many times. Right? And, and some of the observations will sometimes come twice or th three times, but that's basically a, like this version 22, 22, 22. That's the idea of it, basically, that you sample at random your sample. Right? Then I don't bear do like this, I could actually replicate, uh, there is also a replicate function, so it's easy for me to do this sampling again and again by using a replicate function. Just do the same thing five times, and the, the t actually here, I should spell correctly then, replicate, replicate, let's see what happens now. in a way, so we can see it. Now, I, in one call, I have sampled five times, right? So you can see how easy it is to make R do this for us. I do 5, 10, 15, 20, 15. I, it's easy for me. Well, there is an even more easy way of doing it, of course. Instead of writing five, I write 10,000, right? I, I do this 10,000 times. So 10,000 times I have a sample of 11 differences, right? 10,000 times I have this sample. Here, my samples. De my samples. 11 times 10,000. I'm not going to write it out now. That's a big uh, matrix. So 10,000 times I have 11 numbers. Then. I use a little R thing. I'm going to have someone look at this thing. I'm, I'm struggling with this Outlook thing. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> no, I'm not going to comment on that. 
it takes me too far off, I think. Um, I compute many times the mean of those 11 differences, right? That's what I do here. I compute my means. Let's go for the histogram of my means is here. The apply function is just take this 11 by 10,000 thing and compute the average 10,000 times. Right? It's just a nice way of making it go through and compute uh, the average each time. That's, there are some of these functions in R, in R, the apply or the sweep, where you can sweep through or run through arrays and do computations along modes of arrays. It actually works on multi-way arrays also, not only uh, bivariate arrays. That's a technical thing. But we need to be a little bit, I, I think it's pretty naive actually, but we think we must be a little bit computer technical to be able to, to do this. This is the price we have to pay to avoid all the math and the theory. That is, we need to be able to do a little bit of computing in our, our environment, right, to be able to cope here. And then I look at the quantile. There is also a quantile function in R that can compute these percentiles, or quantiles as we call them. I choose to get the 2.5% point and the 95, sorry, 97.5% points. And here's the confidence interval, right? 1.36 and 9.8. Let's look at the, hist the histogram of the means. 1.36 around here, and 9 point something which disappeared around here. That's the confidence interval for the differences based on bootstrapping. Not using any assumptions of normality or anything. Actually, there is an also another approach. I'm just going to mention that. There is actually also a bootstrap package in R that is prepared with a bootstrap function to sort of, uh, in principle, be able to, uh, you could use the terminology, bootstrap anything that you could dream of. Not just, a, not just an average, it could be the square of the average, it could be the average uh, to the power of 0.125, it could be anything, and you can bootstrap it, if you can uh, just put it into the bootstrap function. It's just to say, the basic idea of bootstrap is so simple that we can basically almost do it ourselves by hand here, right? But there is also a bootstrap function that could uh, take care of more complicated things, more complicated uh, computations. And in fact, I should share with you that there are different ideas of how to get the confidence interval. I'm showing the most simple choice. There could be other choices. These would be built in in the bootstrap package to, for us to just pick like that. That's it for the one sample uh, part. That's uh, before we make the jump to the next part. Uh, just uh, see here. That was the one sample. Now you can do an alternative to the pair T test, namely this bootstrap-based confidence interval. At least the hypothesis. Sorry, the confidence interval. 